Hey guys, it's Mark Cardula from Modern Pain Care. I just wanted to come on and do a little Facebook Live this morning and talk a bit about the subjective interview. I think um, as we're talking about pain science, and that's the big buzz as far as everybody's talking about it in social media. And there's good discussions about is this really pain science or is this really just science of what we're doing, which I would tend to, to lean towards the latter as far as we're just incorporating science of what we do. But I want to share a little bit about what we talk about in our courses when it comes to the subjective interview and communication overall with the patient. We had a great discussion uh, last week with Corey Blickenstaff and Eric Kruger, and we talked about motivational interviewing, which is a great skill to get good at as a physical therapist. It's a hard skill. I hate the fact that they call it a soft skill because it's not soft. It's hard. It's challenging. Human communication as far as being able to interact and gain therapeutic alliance with that patient in front of you who often has been through a very terrible experience and is, you know, in a very difficult, dark place. Oftentimes, how do we resonate with them? How do we establish rapport? How do we establish um, some of the therapeutic alliance stuff that we know generates better outcomes with people? But I think we can all agree that we don't always establish perfect alliance with our patients the first visit. It would be lovely if we did. And if we just clicked and all patients bought everything that we were educating them on and they were just jumping on our plan of care. But, uh, Let's let's jump into a little bit of the presentation and just talk about, you know, traditional ways of kind of looking at pain and how it influences our subjective interview and what we know now might be a better way to kind of look at a, a subjective interview based on current science of the understanding of pain. So uh, in physio school, and I know there's more than physios here, I think we have chiropractors, massage therapists, and even some patients who are watching, but as healthcare professionals, we're kind of taught to kind of interrogate the tissue. So we're thought... When we're going to ask questions and we're going to discuss this problem with the patient, we're going to really focus on what are the tissue-based variables and factors can I elicit from this patient? Can I ask them about, you know, pain behaviors as far as, you know, when you load the tissue, does it feel good? Is there mechanical behaviors? And all those things are good and helpful. It's not to say that we should not ask those things. And I think some people who really like to, to be hard on folks who are the pain science crowd, uh, is that all of a sudden they're perceiving them as they're not doing good bio logic uh, examinations and subjective interviews. It's the same stuff that we've already done well as healthcare professionals. It's just when science is dictating that we need to look at this a lot more broadly than simply looking at uh, the tissues and thinking that tissues have such an agency strictly over a pain experience. We know there's much more that's involved in a pain experience than the tissues. So while we should interrogate the tissues to understand, is this sounding like a tissue-based issue? We probably need to understand the patient's story. And if you've listened to our podcast on the Modern Pain Cast that's uh, on our website, we're trying to interview patients. And the big overarching theme is nobody is listening to the story of these patients. If you listen to the podcast and you listen to Peter O'Sullivan's work on YouTube with some of his patient interactions he has up there, you hear stories of patients who have not been listened to or if they've been uh, listened to or the stories that have been given to them from healthcare professionals have been very scary stories and very negative nocebic stories of not really giving them a positive spin on their condition and really stealing self-efficacy and hope. So how do we really understand where a patient is right now and can help them maybe get a better understanding of where we can help them? So like I said, when we look at this and we look at traditional theory, our reasoning and our theory development and our treatment focus and including our subjective examination has really been stuck in that biologic domain, which again is part of the picture but a big missing piece of it. And when we look at literature that shows the best predictors of if patients are going to do well in physical therapy and then recover from uh, painful issues are often more in the psychosocial domain. So it would make sense to us that, man, we should probably be expanding not only our treatments, but definitely expanding our subjective interview to understand the psychosocial being that is in front of us. Also the biologic being in front of us. We're not ignoring that, nor would we ever, uh, you know, advise that, but, it's, it's understanding that we need to understand the big picture, the whole story of our patients. Now, when we look at Melzack's neuromatrix matrix model, and this is taken from the Melzack Katz article, um, we understand that pain is complex. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into this diagram that we could probably have a whole semester of university to discuss and still barely scratch the surface of it because there's a lot in here. So this is what the human being who stares in front of you brings to the table. That's a, that's the patient's 
kind of variables. And we could argue that this may, there may be other things that we need to, to discuss with this model. And is this model perfect? No, we know that. So I'm not going to get into semantics with that. But this is where the human being in front of us lies. But where does healthcare lie is the interesting thing. Well, healthcare takes all these little categorical silo views of a human being, and we ask questions and we do treatments that really cordon us off into very specific little parts of this big theory of what we know about the person. What this results in is people that get different stories and different perspectives, especially if they end up with ologists that have uh, impacted their care, where they've seen every specialist under the sun, who all have given them pieces of a story who nobody is putting it together for. So I've seen patients regularly working at big health systems who've been to endocrinologist, immunologist, neurologist, orthopedist, you name it. And all these people have different labels and different uh, diagnoses that they're going to put upon the patient. And the patient, to me, if you think about that as a patient, that sounds freaking scary. I'm getting more and more labels just piling up here. Nobody's figuring this question out. My pain's getting worse. And we could all argue that some of the stories and things that we give to patients and that they hear probably raises up the fear factor that we know can increase central sensitivity and the factors that come from a top-down uh, modulating experience from the central nervous system. So needless to say, healthcare sucks when it comes to understanding the whole human being in front of us. So how do we do differently as physical therapists? And I think it starts on the front end. It starts with our subjective examination. It starts with being willing to just suspend biases and just listen to the human being in front of you. We all have our biases. I have my biases, you have your biases, and patients have their biases, but we have to understand that and kind of create an environment where patients can freely express themselves. So we'll talk about that in a second, but this is maybe even a little bit of a reductionist diagram of what we know with the pain experience. When we think about all the things that our, our central nervous system is taking into the brain, is taking into and the body is part of the brain's determinant so we can't cordon off the brain and the body we can't become too brain bound um, because without a body the brain has no information to go on to make decisions on what's going on so our body is an extremely important sensory uh, uh, mechanism to feed information into our brain to make some decisions so extra receptively we're obviously going to be getting a lot of environmental cues sight sound smell taste different things that our senses will be giving us interoceptively We'll be getting information from our tissues, from not only our musculoskeletal tissues, our visceral tissues, different uh, within the brain. It's going to be giving us interoceptive information from, you know, uh, information we might have lying in the brain. Um, we'll get emotions. What's our emotional state? What's our baseline stress system state that leads us into that painful experience? That kind of co coincides a little bit with baseline sensitivity. We see studies. I just posted an Instagram picture of folks who you know, the the uh, quote about, you know, it's hard to get a man to understand something when his salary doesn't, depends on him not understanding it. That's when we see orthopedic patients where we can predict whether they're going to do well with a post-operative knee situation. Are they going to have chronic post-operative pain? If we can just look at them on the front end and see that, man, they have a baseline. There's a bunch of central sensitivity. We can measure that with condition pain modulation and temporal summation type things and studies and predict whether somebody's going to be uh, driving into chronicity going forward. Now, those aren't maybe things we can do perfectly in the subjective, but there's a lot of things we can learn about a patient in our subjective interviews as far as how their symptoms behave. Does it make sense? Is there a sign that, man, this the gain setting on their nervous system just turn up full tilt where there's just this massive disproportionate uh, reaction to, to stimuli that would make you think, man, maybe there is some central sensitivity or magnification going on in the, or facilitation, I should better say, in the central nervous system that's influencing the pain experience. <clears throat> and then some of the big things I think our subjective interview needs to come across with patients. What's the cultural context that they live in and, and, and function in? Not only culture as far as, you know, are, you know, are they European in culture? Are they in a culture that's more expressive with pain or more stoic with pain? But also, what's their family culture like? Do they have a family that has folks with fibromyalgia in it? We know that when we look at studies of patients, I think women who have a mother who has fibromyalgia are eight to nine times more likely to develop a chronic widespread pain issue. Um, so we know that the culture that people function in can influence their their nervous system's modulating capacity. And it, it basically through learning and cultural learning of how we are to understand 
the beliefs were to ascribe to our pain experience and the resulting reactions or behaviors that are culturally accepted to react to a pain experience. So that kind of goes with learning. And if you read uh, Mosley and Vlain's imprecision hypothesis, which is just basically conditioned uh, learning and other behavioral conditioning type concepts about how we can learn to produce pain, I guess, or how our system can become behaviorally conditioned to produce pain with other environmental cues and other things around pain experience. So we have to understand what has the patient learned in their past? What kind of experiences have they had in their past life or past life experiences, not past life. We're not going that far into the mysticism, but um, what are the, the past life experiences that that patient brings to the table that might be important pictures or important things to draw out? An example, in my practice, I had a patient who, as I was talking to her about pain, she had CRPS in actually two different places in her body. And uh, I was talking about, you know, how past experiences, you know, can influence how our system becomes sensitive or not sensitive. And that kind of triggered her to share with me, and this was after knowing her for a while and establishing some significant rapport with her, that uh, as a child, she had two incidents where her stepfather attempted to drown her in a bathtub. So I think step back from that. I mean, if you have a person who in the most safe place in the world for them, their home with mom and dad is the most dangerous, life-threatening place on earth to them, how does that influence their nervous system going forward? I mean, you can't imagine how, how much that's going to affect somebody. Um, when there is no safety in the world, when everything's a, a dim to them. So I think <clears throat> we, understanding those factors can help us kind of, you know, I'm not saying we need to counsel people on that experience. My next reaction was, are you talking to somebody about that? Or have you spoken to somebody about that? Because I'm not here to, that's some deep stuff <laughs> psychologically that I have no business starting to counsel that patient on. But I can plug in and piece the, uh, the, put the pieces together, hopefully for that patient to help them understand that that experience is part of them and influences how they're going to experience pain going forward. So understanding their environment and their context, both family and work-wise can be important because it influences our nervous system's modulating capacity. And then as a result, that pain that emerges can be very different. There is no scripted subjective interview that I'm going to be able to give you that works for every patient. But I think you can have concepts of if you can understand some of these things, they're, they're factors that you can draw out and hear from a patient and maybe ask some <clears throat> pointed questions that can help give you some of that information to better understand that patient. So uh, this is a graph I like to discuss because allostasis is our body's continuous efforts to do physiologic processes to bring ourselves back to a homeostatic baseline. And, and we in physical therapy and in probably healthcare in general, we're looking in depth and I think we have so much imaging and all these things to just explore biology to the nth degree and we've based on statistics I think we can all understand that that has not really answered the question or really solved the issue of chronic pain it's getting worse and statistics don't really trend in a good direction when it comes to that so but I like to think of it or what are the other loads that are on the patient as far as not just mechanical and they're important loads I'm not saying we throw away mechanical loads we need to understand those type of loads that are on our patient but what other psychological loads are on the patient? When we hear those stories like I just shared with you and social loads, do they have workplace pressure? Are they in a situation where if they don't maintain their work uh, abilities that they're gonna lose their job, lose the ability to feed their family, all kinds of horrible things that can happen to people with a pain experience. So understanding some of the social loads, uh, you know, I have a, a good colleague uh, who works with special forces and a good friend who that's a culture where pain is not an acceptable experience. You can't show pain. You're a weakness to the unit. You are a threat to the survival of your, your colleagues in your unit. So we have to understand the unique social life that our patient functions and lives in and how it can possibly influence their experience. So this is a great gra a graphic that I take from Matt Lowe's study in 2017. I'm going to put this uh, link this study in the comment section because I think it's a great study to really he takes it, <clears throat> a, what we call a dispositional approach in this study, but basically that we can't just look for one linear causation type where we're going to identify one factor that explains a whole patient's pain experience. So uh, this kind of plays off of uh, Cohen and John Quintner's thought, thoughts about the third space that we create with a patient. So we can understand all the factors that might predispose a patient to having a pain experience emerge. So what we have to understand with that is that as physiotherapists, we are our own human that has expectations of what that patient encounter is going to entail and hopefully the outcome that's going to come out of that patient encounter. 
We also have our unique social and cultural backgrounds that might ascribe different beliefs and meanings and things that we hopefully aren't going to impose upon the patient. Um, we have personal and professional knowledge and ethics that we bring to the table that we have to understand that our knowledge base might be a little biased. I think as a physical therapist, we might have a bias to see pain a little bit more physically than maybe we know it truly is. Um, but we also have previous experience with patients and different things that are going to influence us. We have cognitions and perceptions of patients. Uh, apparently, we actually think and perceive stuff, too. Uh, we're inactive. We engage. And then patients share those same things. But in the end, we have to create this intersubjective space with that patient to recognize that we both have these unique perspectives, that we should create a space where we're both freely able to share them, where there is not any imposition of beliefs and our culture and our you know thought processes and we just let our thought processes interact and we see where are some areas that we can interact well with a patient and hopefully find some you know areas that we can identify that as a, a partner and come alongside a patient we can be an expert and coach them and give them good information and help them achieve some of their valued goals but um Ideally, we're, we're finding some of those valued goals that are meaningful to the patient. I think one of the big things that I think as I work with students and some clinicians as I mentor that I see is we kind of don't really get to what makes the patient tick. What are the things that are the fabric of their being, their identity that they may have lost that they that really they want to get back to that gives them some sort of purpose and, and hope that they can start functioning and living a valued life again. Because oftentimes when we see them, that's not the, the case. So uh, that's just a little bit of what I wanted to share with you guys this morning. I could talk about this stuff for ages because I think it's fascinating. I think this are the, the soft skills and understanding these different parts of the communication piece. And then going back to what we talked about at the motivational interviewing uh, discussion of, of understanding how do we best structure communication and dialogue with a patient to help them um, kind of hear reasons from themselves of why they might need to take on behavior change and different things because simply telling people to move more and not hurt as much just ain't going to work and it doesn't and that sounds stupid just saying it but you know I think often we just assume that our treatment programs and different things are going to just magically make a patient better um, and I think we can all relate that we have a lot of patients that don't get better and um, a lot of the folks here that we talk to and a lot of the experts that I that I talk to, they fail too. I mean, but the, the best thing we can do is do our best to understand that person in front of you. So I, I hope this talk was uh, helpful for you guys. I'd love to hear any questions you have. What are the things in your subjective interview where you feel like, man, I, I feel like these are the pieces where I struggle and we can talk about them. I'm going to share some resources in the comments about some articles and different things that uh, we can talk about and share some resources so we can all improve as a group. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and we'll be talking to you later.